Hey everyone, how's it going? Um, a little clam there on my 16251. Just came in from walking the dogs because we're getting uh, 13 inches of snow, so a little chilly on the old hands today, but whatever. Um, how's everybody doing? Thank you so much for being here today. And uh, to start off with everything, hi everybody. Phil Mingan, as always, uh, doing the, uh, the moderation. And I got a lot of good friends here already. Hey, everyone, Tom Minette, Jason Carter, uh, Five Watt World. What's up, Keith? Just got off the phone with Keith, who was helpful. Today, today was Keith's idea, so if this goes wrong, it's all Keith's fault. Uh, Nikki, hey, what's up, Nikki? Uh, wow, there's so many people. I'll get, I'll get to say hi to everybody, so thank you so much. So, um, first of all, happy holidays to everyone. Um, I'm going to be doing something next week, and I, I think I'm going to take the week between Christmas and New Year off. Um, Realize I've been kind of working a lot, so it's been fun. But I, th I think it would be kind of nice to take a little bit of a, a little bit of a break and then see you guys after that. Um, some cool stuff going on. I'm putting the finishing touches on my course with Brett Papa, and I'll talk about that right now for a couple of seconds. That is um, a course on some of my influences: David Gilmour, Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck, and Eric Clapton. And it's sort of like a quick guide into getting into some of those players styles not so much how to sound like them but things that i've learned from them so you know these are my heroes little things that i've learned that have really influenced my guitar playing throughout uh all my life actually so we've talked about clapton as we've done before really talking about vibrato and bends and those nuances and all those cool things that we know uh, page actually page is probably the most difficult one of all out of all of them for me because his uh he is um, has so many different styles, and he, he's very he's super original and cool. So I think you guys are going to dig it. Um, that's coming out with me and Brett Papa. The potential date is right after New Year, so we're shooting for that. So I'm looking forward to that. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. It's a really big course, really a lot of information. So all right, that and we have um, all my courses are on sale as always through my website only at 20% off. You enter the code live 20. And all right, so I added in um, uh, in a lock in in the list here. I think I can just do it here and bang it out again. There we go. I was playing through a jazz blues, and uh, there is a. I just put the link in the chat, and it's also in the description of just the chart. So let's talk about. Last week we talked about what to practice or how to practice or my practice schedule, and one thing that Keith brought up, which I thought was really cool, Keith Five Watt World, was. Um, you know, as a teacher and as a player, it's super important to establish a goal. Like, why, do, or why are we playing guitar other than just, I like it, which is the main reason, right? But we have to set certain goals as a player to move towards and feel like we've made these milestones. And hopefully your teacher, if you have a teacher, can do that, or you could do it on your own. So I just want to use an example of a jazz blues, and I'll talk more about this um as i go through it but so for instance i think a, what i get from a lot of my students you've been playing guitar forever you feel like you're not really improving you're playing the same stuff over and over again and all of this and and what i mainly say to someone is well maybe you haven't had a teacher to give you a, a road map but the, the road map also includes goals so by this time you want to be able to do this so 
let's do something fun as opposed to, last week we talked about arpeggios and we will talk about that but um i sent out a jazz blues now a jazz blues is a great way for you to work through your chords so this is how i would work through this so my goal would say okay my practice thing my goal here is to be able to play the comp the chords and comp on a jazz blues so the first thing if you're not really familiar with your chords and this is the way i approach it uh, with students is okay so our, you can take a look with me i wish i could bring it up on screen i hadn't uh i didn't plan that out ahead so you just click on that link so jazz blues basically what we start do, doing is adding on a two five one and a one six two five so i have a seven my one chord d7 my four chord a7 now e minor seven a7 the first thing i want to do is play this as straight as possible D7, D sharp diminished 7, A7, where's my F sharp 7, B minor 7, E7, and I'm having my turn around there, 1, 6, B minor 7, E7, A, or A7 again. So as I go through this, the first thing I want to do is know those chords. So my goal is to have this memorized, be able to hear those changes, and you can set yourself a time goal, like, okay, by the end of the month, I want to be able to do this. And I go through this, especially when I was in college, of course, when I had tests where I had to be able to play a jazz blues and know how to play a one, six, two, five in three different positions using these different voicings. So the only way I could get through that was to take it individually, one thing at a time. So I'm going to, I'm starting off uh, pretty, uh, please, rudimentary, in other words, the basic bar chord fingerings. If you're not familiar with those, you want to get those down first, because we're starting to expand on those. So the first thing I would do, like I said, is work through those fingerings, and I would work through them in, is, two different ways, like root on the fifth string bar chords and root on the sixth string bar chords. So be able to play each of these chord progression, each of these chord voicings in two different positions. And this is a good way to start building on that goal of some freedom to be able to kind of go through the changes. So, um, then my A7, so okay, if I'm gonna spend H7, I can, here's my other A7. D7, E7, now E minor 7, A7. D7, D sharp diminished 7. A7. F sharp 7's go there. My B minor 7. Sorry. A7. F sharp 7, B minor 7, E7. Back to A7. So I want to memorize that. Now, I know this is kind of like goals and practicing and how to practice. And to me, they, they go together because um, I find when I'm practicing stuff, especially something like a blues, you're going to be using this forever and ever and ever. One, six, two, five, one is so common. And a jazz blues is really ubiquitous because if you, it's a jazz blues, you're playing jazz. If you're playing on a jazz gig or a jazzy gig and B.B. King plays these kind of things, if you're called to, to play a blues, it's gonna be this. It's not gonna be your regular old 12 bar form or form the 12 bar chords. You're gonna have these extra chords added in. All right, so then what I would do is isolate what the problem is. So the problem probably for me when I first started was the one, six, two, five, one, right? So first thing I would do is A7. Okay, there's my F sharp seven, B minor seven, E7. There's my A7 again. So, All right, so that's the change. So the next thing I want to do is have that under my fingers. I feel confident with that. Now I want to learn it in another position. A7, these are just the basic bars. F sharp seven, this one sounds great. We can talk about all that in a sec. To B minor seven, that or this finger. To E7, back to the A7. And also, I'm just really straight, you know, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. You want to make it sound, 
you, you want to get the time right, and you want to play it as straight as possible. Well, swing it a little bit, but uh, what I mean, we're, we're not ornamenting anything as of yet. We want to just go through the blues and hit those chords in time, because you know what, you want to have this so in your sleep like a regular blues that if you're in a jam and you look over and you don't go, where are we again? Like, where is this supposed to be? So you, especially uh, when you start soloing over these changes, you need to have them internalized. So the goal, once again, here is to internalize a jazz blues. Now, on the teaching angle, so students will come to me and they'll have taken a stab at it. You know, I've kind of poked around with some of the changes and then they'll just kind of play a few things and I'm like, can you play it for me? And almost inevitably, uh, they can't. They can't make it through the whole thing. So that tells me that there was no, there was no goal. You were kind of playing at it. So if you write down in a calendar or like a little sticky note, jazz blues. So you, if you just pick up the guitar one day and you only have a half hour to practice, maybe run scales for a couple minutes and then go to your, the goal. Get the goal together because getting something like this together, I'm, I'm pointing at my chart that's on my phone. Getting this together will do a ton of, it'll, it'll last you the rest of your life because you've done the work and, and got it together. All right, so, um, so then the next thing I would do, once I feel confident in how to approach this on two different string sets, I'm gonna start to think about what are other voicings that I can do, as opposed to this two, five, one, for instance, you know. Like that's, that's high school jazz band kind of stuff right there, because I know I was, <laughs> that's what I did in high school jazz band. So then you start thinking about, well, I can kind of make it a little prettier, you know, A7 to D9, A7, E minor 7, A7, D9. So a lot of these voicings, I ran over a lot of this stuff in my six voicings, chord voicings you must know, six jazz chord voice, the blues chord voicings you must know in one of my uh, earlier feeds. So. So the next thing I'm going to think about is being able to play this along with a track or a metronome. That's the next goal. Okay, I've got this memorized. The f just to backtrack a hair, I don't even try to play this in time yet because if you're not familiar with these chords, it's going to take you a little while to work through this, right? I remember the first time I started learning jazz standards and I had to work through those changes like autumn leaves or something pretty simple like that. It took me like an hour to read through all those changes. So it, it's a skill, so you're also developing a skill of reading, knowing how to read a chart. All right, so um, the next thing I would start to think about as, is how can I start to think about soloing over this? And I would also break everything down to my, um, I also need to break everything down to its simplest stuff. Or if I want to start soloing over this, I'm just going to choose one thing. One other thing that people do is we bite off much more than we can chew. If I say like, okay, let's work through soloing over this blues with all these changes, and you're like, what? Um, just make one, one change. So it's these incremental growths that, that actually help us achieve the goal that we want to get to. It's super easy to get overwhelmed with all of this. So I've learned that if even if I'm learning a guitar solo or a, a classical piece or something. I might just, my goal is the first four bars. That's it. You know, so if it's that, you know, some of the, the box, that I, if I don't remember, you know, like. That, that kind of stuff. You have to do it bar by bar. So my goal would have been, okay, by the next day or two, two days, I'm going to shoot for the first two, two bars of the first four bars. Then I'm going to move on to the next one. Because if we try to dive into this and set up an, an unobtainable goal, I think that's really not, um, not a good way to do it. Because you're just like, oh my god, i got this whole thing I've got to memorize. I'm never going to get through it. All right, so if I want to play over this, maybe I just want to outline my A7 chords if I'm soloing over it, and then just the rest I start playing as a regular blues. So I'm going to take little ideas like this. So this is just an example. I want to talk about some other stuff. Um, but this is one, one way that you're thinking about, okay, well, what does he mean by getting a goal? Choose something. And one thing uh, I think is a great idea is learning repertoire. Like my goal 
for you, and we can run over this in a coming, um, in a, in a coming uh, lesson, is 10 blues standards you really need to know how to play. You know, just the ones you go to a blues gig and you're not going the whole time. So your goal should be, I'm going to memorize 10 blues standards. And then you start working through it. Then you have something that you want to achieve. Okay, so I've memorized the 10. I want to learn maybe two different keys. Okay, great. And then you say, well, okay, well, I want to try to solo over those 10 songs. And you just take one at a time. But the idea, if you just want to learn more blues tunes and you're grabbing stuff from all over the place, you're learning all these things, it, it just doesn't work. Because um, I know I've tried for years, you know, just that, hodgepodge approach of running around stuff when I finally figured out oh I, I have to settle down and, and figure out something I really really want to learn that's what made me better and I also figured make it small and make it attainable all right if you say like I want to learn eruption okay cool are you at that point or is it or are you going to be like lifting that 500 pound weight off the ground going <laughs> every day and thinking it's going to get easier and it's not so if you have some sort of technique to get you to start to play eruption, then you just work on the first, the intro of it. Get each lick first and then keep on moving through uh, because those things are super challenging. So everything is sort of challenging on the guitar, really. Um, okay, so it's the same thing I'll, I'll do with learning tunes. Like I said, if I have a gig, I'm here, I'm going to start to go through the gig and through the tunes. But 10 blues tunes or make a list of your own of your favorite rock tunes or blues tunes. Don't bite off more than you can chew. We're talking about things that often, these things also build up your confidence, right? So I do this a lot when I'm teaching with people, uh, or teaching people, I should say, that uh, it's so easy to want to learn all these tunes, but you have to narrow it down. And don't even worry about soloing over them. Just learn the form, learn the tune, learn it as best as you can, and start building up the repertoire. And then being able to play that gives you more confidence, and so as you tackle these more things, you get better. But the goal, you, you set the goal, 10 blues standards that I, that I want to learn how to play. Or 10 rock tunes, say if you're a big, you know, the Zeppelin thing, okay, I want to learn how to play since I've been loving you, and I want to learn the solo. Okay, that's your goal. So you just, every day you start working on a piece of it and go through it, um, and mark your progress. I've never been so good at marking my progress, like writing it down, today I did this, I did that. It was more ab about, okay, I. I know I got, well, I did that with, with arpeggio mark settings while playing arpeggios at a certain speed or something like that. I definitely wrote that down in my more uh, obsessive days. But what's followed through for me is if I want to learn how to play something, um, I will tackle it every day. All right, so um, another example I want to give, when I played with, with Robin, uh, I had to learn all of his tunes. We played a few of my tunes and, you know, 85% of the material was his. And there was a lot of stuff to memorize. So I had, let's just say, 15 tunes or 10 tunes, and I had to think about how am I going to learn how to do this. So the first thing was I listened to the material over and over again and got it in my head. I did not try to learn every song, all the songs at once. I said, okay, by the end of the week, I'm going to know how to play these three tunes. So then I would go through them. Sometimes I would uh, chart them out and then I have to make sure I get off the chart because then you start to you start to rely on the chart. You know what I mean? If you're on a gig and you're like, oh man, I never actually memorized the thing. I started doing that. So the goal would be to learn three tunes a week. And cramming is a different thing. That's that's difficult. Sometimes that's when you have a chart in front of you because it's just too hard to memorize all this stuff. But I will definitely break it down in the goal. Okay, this week, three songs. Three, three songs to memorize in one week. Take one at a time. And then just say, okay, today I'm going to just get through the changes. I'm not even really going to care so much about the time, unless it's super easy, you know, if it's a blues, whatever. But I remember the song that was most challenging to remember. There was a few, uh, if I talk about specifically Robin, one was Rose of Sharon, which is one of my favorite songs by him. But trying to memorize that tune, there's some cool changes in it. And there was another song, um, it was called Night at the Apollo, or, or that's the tune. And that was a lot of changes, and I, I had to memorize that. So what I would just go through is just sat down. Today I'm just going to look at the changes. Work at it for a little bit of time. Take a break. Certainly take a break because if you start to overdo it, you're going um, to 
it you can't really cram the stuff so learn the changes then come back all right take a break think about it pick up the stuff again run through them again so i would do that every morning to try to memorize the tunes and what was nice about that you know for me as a professional we got on the gig you know you know robin and was like yeah wow you, you you know all the tunes i'm, I'm thinking yeah well, I'm not going to not know the tunes on the gig. That's insanity. But um, on the side, uh, as a little conversation with the musician, I knew all the songs. And so that's part of my job. And, it, you know, you want to be good at your job, you know? Okay. Um, all right. So the next goal, so you achieve a good goal. Let's just have one that we just talk about. Ten tunes. We're kind of like blues guys. You're here with me because you kind of like blues and you know me through True Fire and, and the, you know, the blues rock and all this stuff. So maybe a good, you know, few f next month or two, you can come up with ten blues tunes that you want to learn. I can talk about that next week. We can talk about this. I've got those True Fire courses, uh, you know, the, the um, 30 Authentic Blues Grooves. Those are all classic blues tunes, so super important stuff. Uh, it's in the, that's, uh, yeah, Ken Keyes had the song book I have, the, the, the uh, blues fake book. Corey Congelio's got a great one. It's not as good as mine, but it's pretty good. <laughs> he did volume one, he did volume two at True Fire. Both excellent courses. Um, and there's my 30 authentic blues grooves. So, as I've said to you guys many times on here, when I go to a blues gig, people will say to me, oh, I'm surprised you know all these tunes. I'm thinking, well, that's my job. And so what I did was I made the goal of memorizing as many blues standards as I could. Jazz musicians have to memorize as many jazz standards as they can. And the more you do it, and this is the great payoff by doing the goal of the 10 blues tunes, so if you work on, you know, like a checking on my baby kind of like in the... Right? That kind of thing. a million tunes so once you feel confident with that one you can play that riff anywhere because you've worked on it okay other things to think about when you're doing this goal all right so the, you get the memorization of the tune and then then you have to think about am i playing music and this is really important as you practice do this can i play this as musically as possible so as i'm playing this you know i'm, I'm thinking all the time as opposed to you know like you know nobody wants to hear that so i think about am i taking this to the next musical level so the final goal well in many ways is to play along with the original recordings because then you're going to learn a lot there um so th some of those tunes are going to be more challenging than others, right? If you're just playing straight on blues. And then as you're going through this is to listen super deeply to the original versions of the song and then start to try to get into some of the nuance of that they're, of that they're doing it. Um, that was a big thing for me. And it these seems like, I know this is like goals, but those are goals for me. I'm going to learn these 10 tunes. I'm going to get to some of my favorite versions of them. And I'm just going to learn the crap out of them and try to get really deep into them. And I know I'm repeating myself, but you build up your confidence as a musician. Whenever you hear that again in any other given situation, because there's going to be many similarities in blues tunes as in jazz tunes and rock tunes, you're like, oh, I know what that is, because I've already practiced it, and I know I can play that. So the confidence builds, and then you're not like, you know, just taking a stab in the dark as to what to figure out how to practice or what am I trying to get up out of this? So that brings me to the part that Keith had brought up, thank you very much, too, was you know, why am I playing guitar besides enjoying it? Is there a reason for it? And so Keith took a lesson from me, which was kind of um, funny. It, he was saying, and you could please chime in, Keith, would, he, he would send me a... a, a Something, uh, blah, 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 blah. 
way of te- is a way of teaching. Someone can send me stuff they could play for me, and I'll know exactly what I think they need to work on because I've just been teaching long enough that if I can see some physical things or their time or that I can tell that they don't know the fingerboard that well or anything like that, that's important. But what I had said to Keith is, well, well what do you want to work on? What do you want to get better at? And very often people don't have a really strong answer to that. They just go, I just kind of want to get get better. And I'm like, well, you know, you have a certain amount of time in the day. And if you're an adult, you know, do you want to work on becoming a better soloist or a better rhythm guitarist or the overall thing? It really helps to fine tune what it is you want to do and then establish a goal around it. I want to be, I want a better technique. Okay, well then this is what you want to do. Very strictly, I want to work through my major scales and all the positions and I want to work with my metronome and I'm going to work on eighth notes, triplets, sixteenth notes, and uh, chord, not chord notes maybe, um, with the metronome. And then I'm going to work on it every day and I'm going to mark it every day and see what my improvement is. And I want my goal, with a re- within reason, to be, say, sixteenth notes at 140 beats per minute. That's my goal. And you work towards that. If you don't make it, then you don't make it. But that's okay. But you're working towards this this goal. Same thing with... Um, if I'm playing back back to this jazz blues I gave you guys, okay, my goal right now is to make it through a jazz blues, even with just using my basic chord changes. Uh, no, you could throw in nines or whatever you're comfortable with, and then learn voicings on the root on the fifth string and root on the sixth string. There's plenty of other voicings, but if you have those, you're gonna be covered. You know, you wanna be, you're gonna be good. You're gonna have covered the bases to get you through the situation that you need to get through and you have it memorized and then you can play with a metronome. So that's a goal. I'm gonna have this I'm gonna have this jazz blues nailed. And then as you go through it, you start doing the stuff that you should be doing when you're practicing. When you hear this, you know, the one six two five one. Like, you know, I got rhythm and um, so then you start to identify a one, six, two, five, one. All right. So then the next goal in my mind would be I have to change keys now. Okay. So let's try something in a different key. Let's try something that would be, this is a guitarist way of thinking. All right. My first chord is A7. So as a guitar player, we're probably going to grab that, right? Because that's because we're guitar players. Well, we we'll probably grab that, but A7 first. Okay. So let's say we want to move something to a key, like a jazz key, like F. So we want to move to a situation where maybe we want to start on root on a fifth string chord. Um, it should be the point where neither of it matters, but I'm talking about if you're just getting into it, as guitar players, we think about things in root on the fifth string and root on the sixth string chords. So make a goal. Okay, I want to learn a blues in F, but now I want to start to play it with a root on the fifth string. I'm going to start here. Right, so you're gonna go through the one, six, two, five, one, and you figure out where that is in a different part of the fingerboard. Um, that's the next goal. All right, I, I know this isn't the most exciting uh, uh, thing, you know, like uh, play some more blues licks or something, whatever. Oh, what a really funny, bu- funny, funny thing! Uh, I just want to somebody we had a, we had a, <laughs> a little bit of a troll. You guys remember last week, and I lightly lost my temper. I got a great email from the person, and he was online, and he apologized because his uh, seven-year-old son had typed it while he was away from the computer. <laughs> so he got a very nice email, so that was nice to know that it was uh, the the uh, the wily child doing it. So that was fun. All right, so let's get to um, let's get to some some questions. Um, and uh, like I said, I'm glad, I hope you guys are digging this. I hope I hope you like it. I think it's important to talk about this stuff in the world of instant gratification and Instagram and videos of people just ripping and shredding and all this stuff. This is how you get there, though. <laughs> you know, and it was what I learned really after a certain period of time was if I don't practice this stuff methodically and set a goal and an end, it, my what my goal is to get out of it, it'll never happen. So I, it's almost like going on a diet. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, trying to lose weight or something. How much you want to wait? I want to lose 10 pounds by this day. Well, what do you have to do? Same exact stuff. All right. 
So, um, so just for the fun thing, um, here, if you, I'm gonna play a, a, here's my little, here's my, my bone for the day. I've got an E6-9 chord. So we have an E9 chord, right? So it's gonna drop that down, my third finger, so the note's gonna be E, G sharp, C sharp, F sharp, and B. Oh, there's a great goal. Memorize the names of the notes on the fingerboard by the end of January if you don't know them. Perfect way. That's a goal. That is a goal. All right. Okay, so the trick for the day. There you go. There's the, the Christmas sounding trick. Right, let me show you that just because it's fun. I have E69. Okay. Uh, the SRV chord. Yes, he invented it. Nobody had ever played a 6-9 chord before him. A 6-9 chord is an E major pentatonic scale. All right, so check it out. I'm going to take the flat part of the pick. I'm going to take the round back part of the pick, right? And I'm going to bounce it. I'm going to go two frets up on my fifth string up, and I'm just going to bounce it as fast as I can. There you go. That's a fun little trick. Here's your little candy for the day. I use that one a lot, and here's the beauty of that one. Check it out. E major pentatonic, right? E, F sharp, G sharp, B, C sharp, E, F sharp. Sorry, yeah, yeah F sharp, G sharp, B. There's that C sharp. So here's E6, 9, E, G sharp, B, and I'm going to have the, uh, there's my, the six, which is the B, and the nine is the F sharp. And when I tap my pick two frets above, look what I've played. An E major pentatonic scale. So this is just this kind of cool little dream sequence, uh, e, ma e major pentatonic scale. I know you're changing scenes, but it sounds great. So it, or like... There you go. All right, so that was my little. It's funny when I teach workshops, kind of they want to do those things like here's some fun noises. Like everybody's like, oh, that's the cool. That was the best part of the whole workshop. <laughs> that's the goofy noises. So we can do some more of those. All right. Any questions, guys? Um. First of all, thanks to everybody who was here. A lot of people tuning in to I know not the most exciting subject, but as I repeat myself um it's about the work oh here's an interesting thing I saw, there's this spectacular guitar player on um instagram hey what do you know <laughs> yeah. somebody with amazing technique and chops he's from australia he's a younger guy plays kind of fingerstyle totally freaking amazing i saw an interview with him and i thought oh here he has to say and he said well how do we um how do how do you do your videos? And he said, well, the first thing I do is I write the piece, the one minute long piece. I write it. And then I practice it for about three or four hours, four or five hours to make sure I have it perfect. And then I'll do maybe um, a few hours of takes to get the best take possible. And then maybe it won't happen that day. And then I'll come back and do it the next day again and see what I can do. And I'm like, so, you know, we have to keep in mind, everybody, that those videos that you see someone just kind of shredding, you don't know how many takes that took or how much practice or what their goal, their goal was to get this video done, right? Uh, like that, that Matteo Satseo, who's just a ridiculously good guitar player, who, who's a master of this. He writes these great one-minute compositions. He's fantastic, and I, I love his stuff. Um, but, you know, it might have taken him quite some time to put that together. So what's his goal? Every week, I need to have a 60 second or every two weeks, wherever I'm long, however he puts them out, I need a 60 second Instagram clip that is, you know, is something that I can put up. So that's a goal that they do. Okay. Um, how do you find your limit? Uh, um, how do you find your limit? What's your limit? And act accordingly. I'm not sure exactly what, excuse me, what you mean by my limit. In terms of techni 
technical, like how fast I can play or something. Um, I guess there is a, a limit. Um, I just keep on going until uh, it, that's like until I can't go anymore, that's ridiculous. Until, I, I, until it feels good, you know. After practicing technique for a little bit, I'll just switch over to actually trying to play music with the technique, maybe like a line or an idea that will work into my playing, something that is not scales. And we can talk about that another thing, like what the difference between track practice and playing. So if I spend hours working on my chops, that makes me only good at playing major scales. And then the next thing I want to do is actually try to incorporate that into some sort of musical idea. Um, and I just try to work it up to the tempo that I want to play it at or use it or work it at. And I hope that answers that question. Um, to be clear, learning stuff, this is from um, Bro. To be more clear, learning stuff in some way might be more like memorizing the boxes, but without knowing uh, where the third and the stuff is. Yeah, the third is, okay, so let me just paraphrase that. Um, guitar is very box and picture oriented. So start there. If you don't know those, you need to know those. And any guitar player who says they don't, think about shapes or uh, patterns is lying. You know, there's just different levels of it, right? You know, uh, Alan Halsworth, one of my favorite guitar players of all time, you heard him play some of the same ideas over and over again. And I don't mean that in any insulting way whatsoever. I mean, they, they were just these amazing sort of patterns. Um, and they're melodic patterns, and he practiced them. And so I'm assuming when he wrote a tune, his goal was he would record the tune, and the goal was to practice over it so he can learn how to play over his own song. I've done the same thing for the record that it was Robin. There was some, uh, he wrote the tune uh, 1968 and had a really a bunch of changes that were really challenging for me to solo over because I'd not encountered those, you know, this kind of super fusion or the really fusion-y tune on the record. And um, so I had to practice the heck out of it. So I practice the changes, learn the changes, went through it, figured out what my options were musically, what scales would work, broke it down as in intellectually as possible to see if I can learn all my options. And then I started to solo over it and improvise over it and then work through it and then see what would come out. And then sometimes I worked out a line that I thought, well, this works really great and I don't have this under my fingers, but it'd be really nice on the record. So, you know, getting a like lick or two under your fingers is totally cool, especially when there's something really difficult coming up. Okay, um, any good, mute? any idea on good muting techniques? Um, you know, I saw some other questions that I got to get to. Well, uh, you know, well, yeah, I'm always muting with the lower part of my hand. If we're talking just the scale, I'm always the heel, okay, this part of my hand, my thumb is always going to grab the lower strings, right? So if I'm just going up a scale, <laughs> See, I'm just kind of rolling along like this, where the heel of my hand, and that's getting my lower strings. And then you kind of roll with the, the fingers on the upper side here. So if I'm playing this D. The only thing that's really ringing out is that D. So that's what I'm thinking when I'm muting. Um, your mileage may vary, but that's generally what people are often doing. I, I'm resting my hand very gently as a guide on the bridge of the guitar. I'm not pushing down, you know, just lightly on there as the guide. And the lower strings be start to become muted by the, the heel or the palm, of, of the, the heel of your palm. Hopefully that answers that question for you. Um, okay. <laughs> Tom Annette, how do I learn the fingerboard in my sleep? You know, you laugh, but studies have shown if you start thinking about this stuff before you go to bed, right? I've been, I love, I'm really fascinated by this stuff. Uh, so when learning Robin's tunes, what I would do on the ones that were, I thought were giving me problems, I would just lay in bed. I would just run through the chord changes in my head, just hear the music and envision myself playing it. That, I think that really works. People have, there, I hate when people, there's been studies, I've, I've read up upon it. There's been a few studies in the Times about musicians or, or like people who imagined a free throw um, did as well as people who practiced the free throw. And when people did both, they did even better. 
So that was an interesting thing in terms of guitar. So very often, if I can't practice on the instrument, I'll practice in my head. So if I can go through up, up and down E string, here's a perfect example of what I would do for the goal of memorizing the notes. I would, on the subway, and this is even on the T during when I was living in Boston, um, I would go through each string, you know, in, in my head. So E, F, G, but I'm thinking about it, E, F, G, count them up in my head and know them that way and go through each string set that way. The other thing that was much more challenging that was very helpful to me was I would envision the fingerboard going up and down on each different fret. So E, A, D, G, B, E. Now I'm going to come back downwards. E, let's go slow. So it's F, C. I'm only going to use flats for now. A flat, E flat, B flat, F. Next fret, G flat, B, E, A, D flat, G flat. Next fret, G. See what I mean? So I just know what, the, what those all are. And I can tell you, since the goal was to memorize the fingerboard, so I didn't have to think about the notes anymore. So if somebody, this was at music school, guys. I got into music school not really knowing the fingerboard as well as I should. And it was kind of embarrassing. Like, hey, you know, just know it's F sharp. And I'm like, uh, you know, trying to find that note on, you know, an F sharp on a third string or whatever the note was. So that was, uh, you know, embarrassment is, is a great motivator. So I just started thinking about that, keep up in one fret at a time. And there's no speed involved, doesn't need to be fast. You just start going through it. And the goal for me was by the end of the week or the end of the month, I want to start knowing each natural note, no sharps or flats on each string. That's a good goal. Oh, uh, okay, so, um, okay, five watt is Keith. What is my goal for next year? Um, well, on the instrument, well, there's a bunch. Um, first goal is to start working on an, another record. Uh, Robin and I have discussed it. We're going to do something together once things clear up. So I want to start working on material. So my goal is to start writing some songs. So I have to put in that time to do that. And um, an instrumental record. And my goal is with him, <clears throat> we discussed, was to just do a badass guitar record, which I think would be a ton of fun. So um, I, that's the goal. And then I have to think about, okay, I'm going to start to, I want to, one thing that helps me, so other goals, I could just talk about that. Uh, I want a few more up, I, I have an easier time writing ballads. I can almost feel like I can write them all day, humbly. You know, uh, it's the up-tempo tunes that really cause me a lot of problems. And I love up-tempo tunes, and those are the ones I find most difficult. So that's the goal, is to work on writing an up -temp some up-tempo tunes and investigate what that'll take for me to do that. Um, and then as a player, my goal right now um, is having fun, is getting back more into jazz again. Um, just for my own edification, or I know a lot more than I play. And um, as I've gotten older, I hear things more better, more better. You know what I'm saying? I hear things better. I hear more things. I can hear changes much better than I ever did. So now I'm at the point where I'm like, oh, yeah, let me, let me dig into those melodic minor modes again to get some of those hip sounds that, um, that I hear. I'm like, oh, I have that, but I don't have it under my fingers. So that's my goal is to up the, the jazz stuff, um, not to put out a jazz record, but just to to just become a better musician. And it, it's a never-ending goal. And my other goal is to practice more. And I really have to go out of my way to do that as well. Um, I'm very fortunate to make a living on the instrument, but I don't have a lot of time to actually sit down and practice. And I've talked to a lot of my friends about this, especially all of us who are doing these online things and enjoying YouTube and all this. Every time you start practicing, you start thinking, oh, that would make a good YouTube video. That would make a good YouTube <laughs> Like, wait a minute. Let me just practice and just be a guitar player and be in that moment. So there's that and, uh, and uh, working on my becoming, meditating more regularly. That's a big goal for me, which I'm working on, which is helping. All right. Um, are you a fan of the shadows? Uh, you know, no. Uh, there, that was, I think, a really big... Um, British thing. Um, I'm a little too young for that to have them to have them be an influence, I think. And it was very big in England. 
Um, so all my heroes were Big Shadows fans, with Hank Marvin. And I, I love watching the videos, and I was like, wow, this is awesome. So it's this great surf-style band from England um, that Jeff Beck talks about, and Peter Green and Clapton, and Brian May talks about Hank Marvin being a huge influence on him. So uh, I don't have a great uh, background in that stuff. I think someone like my good friend Jason Lachlan probably knows way more about them because he's more into that that genre of music, but uh, I know they're great, legendary. Okay. Um, okay, is that 7622? I don't understand what that means. I'm sorry, that's Dan Samus. We can maybe explain that. What uh, is that X766, like a... A762, I'm, I'm not clear, I'm, I'm sorry about that, I don't know <laughs> what you're asking. Um, my diminished arpeggio concepts, hmm, that's a big one. Um, well, okay, look, here's a perfect thing, here's a goal. All right, so you're soloing over this A blues, right, and on bar uh, five, we six, excuse me, we have a D sharp diminished seventh arpeggio. So your goal should be to be able to nail that diminished seventh arpeggio in one position every single time. That's practice, not necessarily really playing. So, you know. This is real simple. Right, so just I really just shot for on that that one chord. So that's how I started thinking about diminished seventh arpeggios. Is just play the arpeggio using eighth notes every single time it comes along, and then find a different position. Do it. Fortunately, in diminished seventh arpeggios move up in minor thirds. Um, and if you go back in time, we in some of these uh, preview. Sorry, in some of the. Uh, the Brooklyn broadcasts, I did one on adding in a diminished seventh arpeggio into a blues, so it's right there. But that's what I do. That would be the goal, and that was a goal of mine. And it was, okay, here, I learned, first I learned my diminished seventh arpeggio. Okay. And I could learn the whole thing, you know, the whole thing down. Oh, sorry. But I don't need to. I just want to work, work on that little... That little mo that little section, and see that chord inside of there, and hear where that changes, and then the goal would be by the end of the week or the end of the practice session, whatever is reasonable for you, is to be able to play that every single time it goes by, even if it's a very rudimentary like that. You're know, like, when I say rudimentary, I just mean no fancy stuff, but it sounds awesome if you just go. Because you heard, all right, that's all you're looking for. Eh, yeah, play it right. Right, so I'm going right back to that. So that's what you want to shoot for. All right, so that's, that's my first diminished seventh arpeggio concept. Um, uh, okay, oh, David Skinner, yes. Uh, the... Uh, the own answer for learning is fingerboard uh, in your sleep, but it, it's really, I think you can learn it through osmosis. Yes, you can learn the fingerboard through osmosis. Absolutely. Um, obligatory question. With the ox, how's the room volume with the two rock when not going to the direct speaker out? Thanks. Um, okay, so that's a, a, a nerdy gear question, which is totally cool. Um, I almost never, ever use the ox as an attenuator. Uh, maybe maybe a little bit. I'm more right now just going direct with it. And if I'm playing with the, the ox or the two rock in the house, it's got a pretty great um, master volume. And uh, or if I want, I might put the ox a click or two down and so I can turn the amp up a little bit. But whenever you really attenuate the crap out of something, it never sounds 
really great because the speaker's not doing what it's supposed to do. It, it's all a compromise. So every attenuator I've come across have only really worked a few clicks. And then they start to sound kind of buzzy. And at that point, what I do is, um, if I don't think the distortion sounds quite right, I'll just use an overdrive box. Because I think it actually, um, excuse me, can sound better than that, than, than um, trying to get the sound out of the amp at, at a low volume. But I'm, I love the way the, the T-Rock sounds clean uh, at a low volume. It's not, it's not optimal, but it, it still sounds pretty great. <laughs> okay. Um, any advice on how to play in the pocket? Well, okay, yes, that's, okay, so there's your, there's another goal. I want to play in the pocket. So I'm going to play through my jazz blues, and I am going to play every downbeat and try to swing it. All right, so one, two, three, four. Yeah, wrong volume. This, these are backwards. Love the guitar. Those are backwards. Freaks me out every time. So three, four. It's like Freddie Green. I would have a metronome on. That's a great goal. With the metronome, play all your downbeats. And then your next goal might be to, what I started doing, accentuate two and four. One. Or just, just play two and four, like so. Three, four, one, two, three, four. Three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now I'm getting all the chicka chickas in there so you can hear that. I would maybe have to pick up a little more so you're not hearing those that much muted strings in between. But that's, there's a goal. I want to play all my eighth notes, sorry, quarter notes, and I want to play beats two and four, and I want to swing them. That's how I started working out of my pocket, being able to feel that and have that time under my fingers. If you don't have that time, which is the goal, working on your groove, it's never going to happen. Um, well, it may happen. You know, we're playing with records a lot. Like, you know, a lot of guys didn't, like, like Matt Schofield who talked about this stuff. I don't think he's really thinking about this, though on his course he did talk about playing on the metronome in two and four. So he knows these things, but growing up, just listening to records or, you know, Clapton and Robin, they didn't sit there and practice playing on two and four, necessarily just played on records and realized that that's what was going on. Same kind of thing, but I find if you want something very specific and you're having a hard time focusing in, um, especially in you have a limited amount of time, I'm just going to hit beats two and four. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. That's super helpful. Um, all right. Um, where do you start when writing songs? Just with one liquor idea. Oh, that's a great question. You know, I don't consider myself a great songwriter. Um, I, I, let me put it, I don't, I'm not a prolific songwriter. Uh, I do like my music, fortunately. <laughs> You know, and, and some people have been really very complimentary about some of the songs. So I'm very happy about that. Um, when I try to write a song, it, I will... I'm reading John Cleese's very short book, but good book on creativity. And I'm just trying to do the same thing. You set aside the time to work on the song. So I'm trying to set aside the time to just work and mess around. And so a lot of times songs come to me from just noodling. Right? Um, I'm trying to, sometimes you're playing something you're like, oh, that was a really cool chord change. Um, there's a song on my record, uh, uh, Marta, which just kind of came out of, you know. Now, that's the main part of it. Now, all I had was, you know, 
And I kind of... And I didn't have anything after that. So it, it took a while and sat through. And I, what was the melody that I wanted to hear? I wanted to hear like this. So that was kind of cool, right? So we had this E. So I was just kind of working on that sound. Yeah. And I wanted to get maybe a little more dissonant, but um, I will just try not to give up on the idea. You know, some days the thing else comes out, you know, um, I don't have it. I can't come up with what's next, but what I'll just try to do is really not let it go. Like just, okay, I'm not going to do anything else. I got to get that A section together. What am I hearing? And I just try to see what happens and try not to get frustrated. You know, when you get that, like anywhere, you know, when you kind of, you know, a little esoteric, but when you, when you tap into whatever the, the, you know, the consciousness of why we play or anything where you get into that zone and you see it and it's like, oh, there it is. And then pff, and it goes away. And that gets kind of frustrating. And I think the only way you can really work through it is to work through it, to get to the other side. This is just, okay, I'm not letting this go. I'm going to sit here until I get this idea as best I can. And some days, I, you know, you give it up in defeat, but that's why an iPhone is great because you just record it and, uh, you know, kind of catalog it. But I just, tr I just try not to let it go. Okay. Um, how would you approach short and long-term goals with daily practices? That's a great question. The short-term goals for me, the first big goal is to just practice every day. If you do that, you've achieved an amazing goal. Think about that, right? It's like, you know, going to the gym, or so I'm told. <laughs> you know, this, if you, I'm going to practice for an hour every day, and I get to practice at the same time, and put it into your schedule, and try to make it a priority. What's the best time for you to practice? I mean, so for me, it's usually in the mornings, just because my day, nobody really does a lot of lessons in the morning, mostly in the afternoons and evenings. And so the best time for me to practice is early in the morning. Um, have a cup of coffee. Nobody's calling me usually, and that's when I start to focus. So the goal, if my goal, even a small thing, is I want to practice every morning for a half hour, and I achieve that goal, that is huge. So, and in that half hour, if you want to look back to the last week's uh, broadcast where I talk about things to practice, and if you just practice 15 minutes of scales and the next half, 20 minutes of that or 15 minutes you have left, you work on 10 blues tunes and start working through them. That's great. And you're going to see progress like you never thought you would see if you do that. I know that to be true because I've done it and I slip away from it. And when I come back to it, I'm like, damn, I'm such an idiot. Why, why don't I do this all the time? <laughs> so I think, I think a lot of things are like that. All right. Um, and the long-term goals, it, it, there's many, the long-term goals I have is like a record. Okay, so then I have to break that down into smaller goals. I want to do another record, and then the smaller goal would be, okay, I want to write five tunes first. I want to do five tunes. I want them to be two up-tempo tunes, one medium, two medium, and one ballad. Something like that. I want to, so I'll start working through that. All right. Um, catching the Big Fish. Uh, David Lynch is Catching Big on Creativity. I'll read that. I've read about that. Right. It's the same kind of thing. Right. Exactly. Um, All right. Hey, Jason Carter. Thank you so much, man, for uh, the, the top chat. Woo! Thank you, man. I appreciate all of it. Appreciate, appreciate this quite a bit. Oh, okay. That's 16251 you're asking about. Okay, just real fast, and then we're going to wrap it up for the day. Um, is one chord in the key of A would be in A blues A. The sixth chord would be F sharp. We're going to make it F sharp 7. The two chord in the key of A, B minor 7. The five chord E7. Back to the one. That's the six chord. So <laughs> one, six, two, five, one. That's always gonna sound like that. One, six, two, five, one. Hey, check it out, you know? Yeah. Turn around. A 
traditional jazz, a traditional blues turnaround can be seen as a one six two five one as well. That kind of blew my mind that Robert Johnson is playing a one six two five one. It's pretty cool. Um, is it important to practice at the same time every day? For me, it is because then you are giving you are giving yourself you are prioritizing you over the other stuff. And if guitar is a priority to you, then you make the time. I, I don't always stick to this, but when I do, it's when I find I make improvements. If you schedule it in and that's part of your day and you do it every time, and this is what John Cleese talks about in his book as well, like every day, same time you do this, or it's in your calendar. If you can't do it that day, it's in your calendar that you make that time. For me, it just makes most sense for me to get to practicing at about like nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, like I said, I, that's, I have the benefit of, what benefit, my, li my time in life is because my, my, my work is shifted to later than other people's. So, um, okay, but creativity-wise, I'm best at late at night. So the two often don't really work great together. If I'm trying to um, work on scales or write material or something like that, uh, morning. If I'm trying to, well, if I'm trying to write a song, sometimes it's late at night where everybody's, you know, the house is quiet. Nobody's going to call me. I turn everything off. And that's sometimes where I get more into it. But unfortunately, the two don't always work well together because if you stayed up late, you know, that and coffee. Partners Coffee out of Brooklyn. Highly recommended. Um, okay. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate it. Uh, like I said, in, you know, not the most uh, sexy topic in the sense of um, Insta gratification. But, you know, anybody good has worked their ass off. And setting a goal is the way to do it. If not, you, you end up kind of floundering a little bit. And, uh, and oh, go easy on yourself, too, by the way. You know, if you're playing for fun and, you know, people say, oh, I want to, you know, I just want to play for fun. Okay, great. Then you can still set goals, but make them reasonable. If, you know, for college, you know, I had proficiencies. If I didn't know X, you know, A, B, C, D, and E, I would fail. So the goal was not to fail. So I had to know these things by this date. And that was really worthwhile. All right. So thanks, everyone. I will see you next week. And then I'm going to be taking the week off. Super thanks always to Phil Mingan, who is the uh, moderator with the mostest. And you know, thanks, Phil. Really appreciate everything you do. Everyone who's here, appreciate everyone and everyone who hit the tip jar. I really appreciate that. And Everyone, my record, if you want the record now, it is available on Bandcamp. That's the best way to get a record for most musicians. Um, and if you buy it, we see the money, and that's awesome, as opposed to streaming it. So that goes for anybody. You know, pretty much everybody's on, on Bandcamp at this point. Also, all my courses are 20% off, so if you want to get into blues tunes, you must know. I would highly recommend my Authentic Blues Grooves course. Uh, and my blues guitar uh, fake book, volume two, and Corey's volume one. They make a nice companion with each other. There's some crossover between the two because of the, uh, the, I think the blues grooves is significantly older than the other ones. What I love about the authentic blues grooves, it's just done with a live band, with a harmonica player. And I chose primarily Chicago blues tunes as opposed to Texas kind of ones. So it's really heavy on Little Walter and those kind of tunes, which are actually my favorite of those tunes. All right, everyone, I will see you next week. Thank you for being here. Uh, stay safe, you know, all that. And hopefully we're supposed to be getting 12 to 13 inches of snow in New York. Yuck. All right, guys, you're the best. I appreciate it. Thank you.